We'll continue our verse-by-verse study through John next Sunday. It will be in John 14, but today is Mission Sunday, and and uh, we are going to have a special focus on the outreach of SEEK, uh, which means Suba Environmental Education of Kenya. Uh, and I want to remind you that all of us are called to be missionaries in our world. Uh, the Apostle Paul was a missionary extraordinaire. Uh, in one introductory paragraph at the beginning of his letter, entitled Romans, he described our mission in the world, and in a sense, Paul describes not just the mission that we have in our world, but the profile of a missionary. So let's read there in Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from our God, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this letter begins with the apostle's personal name, uh, Paul. Uh, and I suggest that all of us could insert our names there. Uh, and these same words would be true about us as well. We could say Jerry or Vicky or, or you know, Bobby or Jan, you know, uh, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Uh, separated to the gospel of God. Now, first, the profile of a missionary is uniquely personal. Uh, When Paul encountered Christ on the road to Damascus, the Lord called him by name and told him to go to Damascus and and he would tell him what to do. And, And so to a disciple by the name of Ananias, God spoke the words about Paul coming. And Paul was a dreaded person to meet there at that time because he was persecuting the Christians severely. But Ananias said, okay, Lord, I'll talk to the guy when he comes. And so he became uh, the first mentor for the Apostle Paul. The Lord announced that Paul was called as a chosen vessel to bear the name of Christ Jesus to Gentiles uh, as well as to kings and to the people of Israel. And a primary focus, as you know, of Paul's ministry would be to Gentiles. So I believe each of us is called by name by the Lord. And Christ has given each of us a mission to fulfill in our world. And he has, uh, Paul was uniquely designed for his mission. And so are you and so am I for the mission he's given us. Second, Paul introduced himself as a bondservant of Christ Jesus. So again, we let us place our own names there. Jerry, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. So the word for bondservant is interesting. Uh, the part of the word is the word doulos, which means slave. Uh, and in the Old Testament times, there were servants who were temporary in order to work off a debt, but would choose to become bondservants uh, for life. When they had paid off their debt of service, they were allowed to go free, but the master of that servant might be a very kind and gracious person. And so the servant uh, for whom it, uh, they had the joy of, of serving that master, the servant would, could go to that master and offer his services or her services for a lifetime. Uh, and so uh, once the master said, okay, you're welcome to stay. Uh, and so the servant's ear would then be pierced as a sign that he or she was bonded to that master for life. And so a bond servant lived uh, life completely under the authority and under the provision of that master uh, and, and his, uh, his benevolence. The profile of a missionary is one who is a bond servant of Jesus Christ, completely under his authority and dependent upon his provision as well. He is kind, a kind and gracious master to us, isn't he? And it's a joy to serve the Lord. How many of you know it's a joy to serve him because of who he is to us? And we would be hard-pressed this morning to find anybody uh, more dedicated as bondservants of Christ Jesus than Don and Nancy Richards and the faithful staff at Seek in Kenya. Uh, third, Paul wrote that he was called to be an apostle or one who is sent Now, uh, an apostle is one who is sent out by Jesus Christ into the world as an ambassador. 
And we too have been sent out into our world. And here Paul's not especially thinking of himself as apostle, you know, capital A there. He's uh, thinking of himself as just one who's been sent out by Christ. And, and you'll find later that he includes us in that as well. So the word called is used. The idea of being called here, is, as an old professor of mine uh, told us in class one day, it sort of carries the idea of being collared or pulled up in front of the Lord. Uh, and uh, so the Lord kind of, you go down as a bond servant and you're called up and then Jesus tells you what he wants you to do. And so you go down to be called up. And that's what happened to the Apostle Paul. So like a general calling a soldier from the troops for a specific task. Uh, or like Mr. Phelps, if you remember the old uh, Mission Impossible series. And of course there's a new one too. That's well, it's, Now it's probably old as well. But, uh, uh, but anyways, you know, the Mr. Phelps, you know, if you decide to accept your mission, you know, there was this tape recording and all this. And, and uh, uh, should you accept to ex uh, decide to accept it? And Paul had accepted his mission. Uh, he felt compelled by the Lord, and because he was a bondservant, he joyfully obeyed the direction the Lord gave to him. Now, have you ever thought about this, that God has a unique mission for each and every one of us? Uh, and, you know, as a young pastor, I was sitting in a meeting one night, and I don't know if I was bored or what, but I was flipping the pages of my Bible, and I landed in Jeremiah chapter 23. And it was almost like a, a, a chapter, chapter 23 of Jeremiah was describing the... the uh, essentially guys who had become almost false priests of Israel. And they had scattered the sheep. And it was almost like an audible voice spoke to me and said, Jerry, I have called you to gather scattered sheep, to be a shepherd who gathers scattered sheep. And so over the years I've discovered what that meant. But there was a specific calling there. So all of us have been graced with unique gifts uh, and a measure of faith for specific ministry in our world. And as missionaries, each one of us as a missionary has been called and sent out into the world that we've been placed in. Fourth, a missionary is separated to the gospel of God. Now, the Greek word for separated here is, is a forest menos, which is the same word that's used to, for the word Pharisee. Uh, and the Pharisees were separated ones, separated to the law, that they were specialists in, in interpreting the law and keeping the law. Paul had been a Pharisee. And so some people think he's kind of doing a play on words here because he had been a Pharisee. But he is saying, hey, I am still a Pharisee, no longer separated to the law, but separated to the gospel of Christ. Uh, and he became a Pharisee here of a different order. Now, being separated to the gospel is far better than being separated to the law. Uh, the law can only condemn, but the message of the gospel sets people free from condemnation. Uh, the gospel is the joyful report, that good news, that the guilt of our sins has been expunged from the records, and because it was transferred over to Jesus on the cross of Calvary, uh, and he was condemned for us. Praise the Lord for that. No longer there. The record's no longer there of our sin because it's been wiped off. So I hope you see it. Paul went down as a servant, and he was called up. And he was sent out as an apostle and set apart unto God. So you have here down, up, uh, out, and depart. If you can remember those three things. You know, we go down to be called up, to be sent out, and be set apart. So Paul makes the point uh, that uh, uh, he has been sent out with this gospel message. Fifth, a missionary has a message for the world supported by God himself. We're not on our own out there giving this message of the gospel, but God has supported us himself. He makes the point that the gospel is not something that he's cooked up on his, in his own mind. You know, it's not something that he has originated, uh, but is made credible outside of him. So let's take a look at what makes the gospel credible uh, and an incredible message, actually. So verse 2 says, Which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. So this message we have as miss missionaries sent out by Christ is not a new message. It's been spoken about uh, long ago in the Old Testament from the prophets. Uh, the prophetic writing of the Old Testament proclaimed it. There are over 300, and somebody recently told me they think it's, uh, they, they really, there are uh, nearly 400, uh, but 300 messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, and Jesus Christ fulfills all of them. 
For instance, the Old Testament foretold all about Christ. We're told that he would be the offspring of Abraham and, and Isaac and Jacob and Judah and David. We're told of the place of his birth, uh, the time of his birth, that he would be born of a virgin and escape into Egypt, have a ministry in Galilee and be rejected by the Jews. We are told that he would make a triumphant entry into Jerusalem on a donkey, be portrayed by a friend, sold out for 30 pieces of silver, with the money returned for a potter's field, and a place of, the place of his betrayer would be given to another. We are told that false witnesses would accuse him, and he would remain silent. We are told that he would be spit on, hated without a cause, and suffer for others, and be crucified with his hands and feet pierced while being mocked and insulted. We are told that he would pray for his enemies, and his side would be pierced, while men cast lots for his clothes. We are told that not a bone would be broken, and that he would be buried among the rich, and we are told of his resurrection and ascension into heaven. All this in the Old Testament. And every bit of it was fulfilled by the Lord. And that makes the gospel a pretty credible witness, doesn't it? So uh, the gospel is credible because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Scriptures by the prophets supported it. Now, something we need to keep in mind is that the gospel message, this good news message, will always come under attack by the Antichrist spirit in the world. You know that. You see it all the time. Uh, there have been books written against it. There's movies made, documentaries presented, and articles published seeking to discredit Jesus as the Christ. But the Holy Spirit stands behind the scripture and which will abide while those books and those movies, documentaries, and articles will all fade away and soon be forgotten. The Holy Word of God stands, and it stands forever. And it's not going to be uh, put aside uh, because it is the Word of God. Uh, so in verse 4 it says, And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So the word power here is dunamis. It's a power that's not of ourselves. It's, it's a power that is supernatural. It's a supernatural ability that God gives. So when Paul or one of us proclaims the gospel, that message is empowered by the Holy Spirit, uh, supernaturally by the Spirit, to speak to the hearts of those who hear it. So we speak it, but the Holy Spirit is the one, has the power to apply it and, and bring conviction into people's hearts of its truth. Uh, so the gospel is also credible because... Jesus was raised from the dead. And this is what causes the message of, the, of Christ, the gospel of Christ, to especially be so powerful. Uh, and so Jesus died but was uh, then resurrected from the dead and uh, it, by the holy power of God. And then now, as, as Peter declared in Acts chapter 1, that uh, the Holy Spirit came and was poured out by Christ as he is at the right hand of the Father after he ascended into heaven. And so he is alive today. He's living, uh, and he is among us, and he pours out his living spirit into us. And so the Holy Spirit declares him uh, in that way from his through his resurrection. Verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Now, now Paul's got a big broad look there, doesn't he? all nations for his name and actually all through scripture the messiah would be a messiah for all nations the word tells us that god has given paul and to us a ministry among all nations including kenya and including america you know the gallup poll says that nine out of ten americans are not committed christians uh, so what does that tell us the place we live in america is a mission field there's no doubt about it uh, the gospel is cross-cultural. It's intercultural. The gospel is for every nation and language. There is no ethnic barrier with the love of God. There are no social classes that are favored by God. The gospel is for everyone because everyone is spiritually impoverished and everyone needs a Savior. Verse 6, Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, did you know you're a saint? How many of you knew that? How many of you say, yeah, I'm a saint? I heard a lot of Christians say, well, no, I ain't no saint. <laughs> well, I beg to differ. If you truly know the Lord, you are. You know, we are all saints. You know, and so, uh, but most people have the, the idea that saints are special people in religious history. Uh, but the truth is, if you're a believer, you are a saint. And every saint is a missionary. You know, a little boy attended a church that had beautiful stained glass windows. 
depicting St. Paul, St. Peter, and St. John. And one day when asked at his Sunday school class, what are saints? This was his reply. He said, they're people who the light shines through. Uh, See, so he looked at those windows. Good answer. The light of Christ shines through every saint, every person who has confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. Uh, and so uh, verse 8, he goes on. He says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Even though Paul had not yet been to Rome, uh, he had heard about these Romans uh, who had such great faith. There was a buzz that was going on throughout the world. Everything started in Rome. I mean, everybody knew what was happening there. And one of the things that was happening is that there was a growing number of believers in Jesus Christ as Lord, and people throughout the world were hearing about their faith. And so they were doing lifestyle evangelism. Uh, do you know people what people are saying about you and I? What are they saying about us? Are they talking about the faith that we have in Christ? And that's a very important thing for us to live a life that exemplifies the Lord. And so people actually will talk about it. So people are, are closely watching to see if there's any difference between those who confess Christ and those who don't. And someone said we need to turn our theology into biography, you know. That the things we believe in Christ and our, the Lord and who he is to us, that needs to be part of who we are at all times. I'm going to move on up to verse 14 now, where Paul says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now what we see here is that Paul excluded no one from the gospel, not a single person. Uh, and he was following in the footsteps of Jesus. Uh, Jesus reached out to Samaritans. Uh, and he reached out to tax collectors, to prostitutes, to Roman soldiers, to a rich young ruler, uh, to social outcasts like the leopards, uh, lepers and the demoniacs. Jesus loved everybody. And he included everyone in his love and his offer of forgiveness. And so in verse 14 to 16, Paul further identified himself as, with three I am statements. Now he's not saying when he says I am, he's not like the Lord who says I am because he is the Lord. But Paul is just simply identifying who he believes himself to be. He says, I am a debtor to Greeks, first of all, representing the eloquent, the philosophical, and the arts culture, to barbarians, these are people who were considered to be hardened or coarse people, uh, to the wise, representing the, the educated people, and to the unwise, representing the unlearned. You know, he believed that every single person he met was a, a, subject, was a fit subject for the kingdom of God. You know, and, and he, he loved people that way. To use the word debtor indicates that Paul had a deep desire, like a man intensely trying to pay off his debt. You know, I read an article this week about a woman who, who paid off $220,000 worth of student loans, you know. And she basically said, you know what, I just made it the most intense desire of my mind to do that. And uh, so she moved, every time she got a raise, she used a raise to pay off the student debt. And, and eventually she paid it all off. Uh, and so she said, you just have to make up your mind to do it. And so Paul has said it, he, he was indebted. And he's like a man who's obsessed with paying his debt. And his debt was to see that all people groups re were redeemed by the grace of God. Second, Paul wrote, I am ready to preach the gospel. The gospel of Christ filled his heart. It was the main thing, and Paul kept the main thing the main thing. You know, it was always on his mind. It never left his mind. He was just really focused on it always. And so uh, and then he said, I am not ashamed. The third I am, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Another way to say it would be that I am proud of the message that I preach. I'm not embarrassed by it. I wonder if anybody's embarrassed by the preaching of the gospel. Why would we ever be embarrassed by it? Because it's powerful and it changes people's lives. It's something to talk about. It's something to give testimony of. The gospel had never disappointed Paul. Never. It had transformed the lives of those who trusted in its message. You know, the Greek philosophers uh, saw the world as chaotic, and it was, as self-destructive, and it was. The impetus behind their philosophical search 
for meaning included an intense desire to find a solution to the chaos of the world, uh, where people continuously fought against one another, where morality was, was fragile, and, and where true love was just a shadow. They wanted to see that changed. Uh, they wanted an answer that would save the world from itself. But by and large, the culture had given up on the idealism of the philosophers. Uh, and their ideals, ideals had not made the wor world a better place. Paul's statement, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God to salvation, was his way of saying that here is something that the people of Rome can count on. This is something the whole world can count on. The gospel produces the solutions everyone has longed for. The, the, the society, the message that, that the gospel brings will not leave a society in chaos, but it will save it from itself in self-destruction. The gospel will bring order out of chaos in our world. And it's the greatest hope of mankind. Uh, over the next three centuries, because of the redemptive power of the gospel, the world didn't, did become a vastly better place. Uh, that actually happened and a more humane place to live. Peace became prominent in the world, and morality displaced the degenerate life, way of life that Paul wrote about later in the first chapter of Romans. Even in recent centuries, when there has been a repeated uh, repeat, a re repetition of spiritual renewal in the world, the areas where those renewals took place became much better environments in which to live, morally, socially, and even economically. Uh, awakening started the foreign missions movement in America and, and American missionary work perhaps started in a haystack, believe it or not. It was during a th thunderstorm. We'll have some of those this afternoon. Uh, maybe God will call somebody, uh, give a specific calling somebody while they're in a thunderstorm this afternoon. But uh, in 1806, during an awakening at Williams College in Western Massachusetts, Samuel Mills and four other students hid themselves in a haystack to get out of the, to have protection from the thunderstorm. Uh, and while they were united in prayer, and they pledged themselves to go as missionaries wherever God would lead them. Well, out of this group uh, went perhaps the first American missionaries. Just that little group of students in a haystack started it all. And so who knows what can be started with a little group of people even from this church, you know, to do something like that. Some of the greatest impulses for social reform in America's history have come from spiritual awakenings. The anti-slavery movement in America was mainly a part of the reform movement generated by the Second Great Awakening, as were movements for prison reform and social reform and child labor laws, women's rights, inner city missions, and many, many others. All of that came from an awakening that God made in people's hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord and the move of his spirit in transforming people's lives. So when Paul wrote, I am not ashamed, he was saying, the gospel is something that works. It brings salvation to a chaotic life and to a chaotic world. He is saying that the gospel will never ever embarrass us like the philosophies of the world do it will produce amazing results. That's happened in your own life, hasn't it? This morning, the mission's message is that all of us are missionaries. We are bondservants of the Lord Jesus Christ, called by him and sent out into the world with the gospel of grace through Christ and backed up by the prophets of old, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the resurrection of Jesus as the Son of God. This morning we are so thankful for the opportunity to be a part of any missionary effort that goes on in our world. Especially this morning, we are thankful for SEEK. This amazing ministry uh, begun by two very special saints of God, Don and Nancy Richards. Uh, they have raised up and mentored a staff there at SEEK that is dedicated to the Lord in what we talked about this morning. Uh, they reflect Paul's passion. You know, they, this, this staff there, and Tony will talk about this a little bit, but they, they went three months without getting paid because there wasn't enough money to pay them. Not a single one of them quit. 
Why is that? Because they were called. And they had a passion for what they were doing. Each one of them is able to say, I'm a debtor to the people of Kenya, especially to the many who have been orphaned there. Each one is able to say, I am ready to preach the gospel. Each of these saints is able to say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because I have seen the transformed lives of the many who have been touched through the outreaches of seek. And you know, once you see it happening, you, you can't help but stick it out <laughs> and stay with it. Thank you, Lord, for calling us. Thank you, Lord, for the message that came through the Apostle Paul. And today, Lord, we're each thinking about your calling in our own individual lives to be your representatives in the world. Guide us, Lord, into that, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.